All right, next we have a presentation on ethics and best pra practices. David? Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, I was asked to provide um, another in our ongoing series of council member education uh, presentations. Last time, I believe we covered some of the Brown Act. And so this evening, um, Kevin asked if I would discuss some background and updates on conflict of interest laws. So I want to go over basically an overview once again. I think it's always worth um, an occasional reminder about how these, how these complicated rules play out and how we need to think about them. And I also want to provide the council with an update on AB 1439 which is the law that regulates, uh, that's, that now regulates campaign contributions within the framework of the conflict of interest laws. Um, so once again, I get to show you all the offices that are, um, wow. that are here to serve you, Lakeport. <laughs> um, so the Political Reform Act, as you may or may not know, was actually a voter approved initiative um, passed in the wake of Watergate uh, as you know, really something that was looking at ensuring that public officials are performing their duties free from bias. And as you know, it is administered by the Fair Political Practices Commission in Sacramento. The Political Reform Act created the Fair Political Practices Commission. Uh, and that, it, just in case you didn't know, is, is the Watergate Hotel. <laughs> and that was pretty cool. So, um, the Political Reform Act is the primary statute that governs conflict of interest that apply to local agencies. Um, the general rule that we need to keep in mind uh, when we're performing city business is that public officials are not to participate in or use their position, their official position to influence governmental decisions in which you or your immediate family members have a financial interest unless an exception applies. So we can talk about those. The Political Reform Act is aimed at financial interests, okay? That is the entire focus. And so it breaks down the financial interests that are relevant to our analysis to five. Interests in business entities, interest in real property, interest in sources of income. So that could be your employer, that could be someone who rents a room in your home or a property that you own. Sources of gifts and this uh, idea of a personal financial effects, which is kind of a catch-all for if it doesn't fall into one of these other categories. The Political Reform Act gives us thresholds for significance. These thresholds are in the statute. As you'll probably notice, they're pretty low. They, I don't think they've been changed except for the gift one since 1974. So um, if you have a, a financial, if you have $2,000 or more invested in a business or you're a director officer or other managing um, individual of a business, then you have a financial interest in that business. Real property, it only has to be worth $2,000 or more. I think that's probably just about any real property in California now. Sources of income, $500 in the last 12 months, so also very low. The gift limit is now $590 within the last 12 months. This number is actually adjusted every two years for inflation. I think and it just went up in 2023, January 1st, and went up, I think, from like 520 So this was one of the largest jumps um, that I've seen. It is the largest jump that I've seen since I've been doing this work for the last 10 years. Um, and then the personal financial effects rule, which I mentioned before, that number five, is also a $500 net gain or loss over the last 12 months. If, if you have that, if that's going to happen to your finances overall, you know, then that is a financial interest that the Political Reform Act cares about. So our friends at the FPPC write copious amounts of regulations. <laughs> to help us uh, when, we have to, when we analyze whether or not we have a conflict. 
Uh, and they decided that I think there used to be like a seven step analysis and now it's a four step analysis. So they basically just took a bunch of the steps and crammed them together. Um, but this is technically the analysis that you're supposed to undertake when you look at your agenda and you see something's on there that could maybe have some effect on one of the interests that I've disclosed on my Form 700 or even ones that I haven't because like your home, you're not putting on your Form 700 even though it is a, a financial interest because it's a real property that's definitely worth more than $2,000. So the first step you have to ask is, is there a reasonably foreseeable that this governmental decision that I have to make is going to have a financial effect on one of my financial interests? So is it going to, is there going to be one, is it possible that my property value will go up by one penny or down by one penny because I'm going to make this decision um, on a zoning order? If yes, then you have to keep going. If no, if there's just no way that there's any, going to be any financial effect, any effect on my finances, then, then you don't have a conflict. If there is, you go to step two. And that's when you ask whether or not the effect is material. In other words, does the effect matter? And this is where you get into actually probably the bulk of the analysis under the Political Reform Act. There are uh, there is a regulation that relates to each of the five financial uh, um, interests that, that you may have that talks about when an effect is material. So most of you are probably familiar with the 500 foot rule when it comes to property. So what that rule says is that if you own real property that's located less than 500 feet from the thing that you're deciding on, so you know whether it's um, you know the design of a park, or um, you know the the, the, you know, the amendment to the zoning code, um, then the FPPC says you are presumed to have a financial interest. It's basically you would have to rebut that presumption with evidence. In fact, you would actually probably need an opinion from the Fair Political Practices Commission that there is no possible way that this decision is gonna affect your property. There's also another rule that talks about, well, what if my property is between 500 and 1,000 feet from the location of the governmental decision? In that case, there's a slightly different regulation. And that one looks at whether or not um, it's going to impact the highest and best use of my property. Is it going to significantly affect traffic the view from my property, um, these types of things. So there's a, there's a kind of a list in the regulations that you look to to analyze. Um, and then the next is, well, what if it's more than 1,000 feet? Well, then the FPPC says, well, the presumption is that there is no impact, that, you, that that wouldn't be a material impact. Excuse me, there's an impact, but it's not a material impact. But again, it's a presumption and, and theoretically, there could be something that was that was such a big decision that it was going to affect your property outside of a thousand feet. And in that case, um, it's possible that you still could have a conflict. So there's really there's no bright lines, but there are sort of guide rails that the that the regulations give you when it comes to determining uh, materiality. So if you do have a material. Uh, if it is look like it's going to be reasonably foreseeable material impact on your finances, then the question is, can the public official demonstrate that this material financial effect is indistinguishable from the effect on the public generally? And if you say yes, then there's no conflict. Meaning that this decision, yes, this decision on my water rates is going to affect my finances, right? It's going to cause it's you know it's going to cause me to have to pay more money in water rates. Well, you know what? It's also going to make everybody else in the city pay more in their water rates. So there's nothing about the decision that impacts you any different than it does the general public. And in that case, it's okay to vote on that because if you couldn't, who could? Nobody. 
there, there are regulations, again, that demonstrate that, that talk about what it is to impact the public generally. And it's normally 25%. So if it's, if you have a business, if your business is going to be affected by a decision, well, if that decision is going to affect at least 25% of the businesses, then um, essentially it's going to, it's going to affect the public generally and you don't have a there's a special rule now for um, your residential property that you live at your home. Um, now that's only 15% of all residential properties. Uh, but that's the analysis that you that you need to undertake. Um, if it's if if yours if your if the impact on you is different than the public generally, and you know take the example of a you know water rates or something. Um, you know, maybe it the rates are going to affect you like anybody else. But if you own, you know, 50 housing developments in the city where you pay for the water, then that's actually going to affect you differently than it's going to affect everybody else because you have a different type of an interest. In that case, you have a conflict. And so, as you know, then you go to step four. And if you have a conflict, then you have to recuse yourself unless there's an exception. And there's really two exceptions under the Political Reform Act. One is if your participation is legally required. So if, if, three, if three of you guys had a conflict and we didn't even have a quorum, then we would be able to draw lots and select by random which of the conflicted council members could participate. And we have done that in the past. Uh, and the other, uh, the other option is segmentation. So what that basically means is that if the decision can be broken down into multiple decisions and just one, you know, so say you have one thing for the council. Well, if we can take that one item and break it into three and you only have a conflict with respect to item three, then you can vote on items one and two. And I, I think we've maybe have done that um, for certain budgeting decisions, for example. Um, where you can pull out something from the budget and deal with it separately because that is something that a particular council member has a conflict on. Uh, but we haven't done too much segmentation. Um, I haven't done it here. So those are the basic four steps. If you have a conflict, that means that you can't- Do you have a question? Well, yeah. do you want me to hold the question? No, go ahead. So just to get a little clarification, when you're talking about the, the general public impact, uh, and it sounded like you were maybe saying kind of how to quantify that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, so the decision doesn't have to impact everybody in the city of Lakeport, but it you're saying like, if this decision is gonna impact X percent of the people of Lakeport in the same way that it will impact you, then that might not be a conflict because that might be a general impact kind of consideration. That's right. The way the the general analysis is that is you look at the you look at the financial interest that's being impacted. So say it's your real property, it's a home. If we can show that. 25, at least 25% of the homes are going to be impacted the same way yours is, then that actually it's for home, it's actually 15%. Um, then you then the decision is going to have the same impact on you as the quote unquote public generally under the Political Reform Act. And so you don't have a conflict. Uh, so you look at it on a financial interest by financial interest basis. So if it's business, so if it's going to affect your business, then you look at whether or not it's going to affect 25% of the businesses in the same way. Thank you. We, we, as a recent example that we did a couple of years ago, um, what came before the council was an undergrounding district for utilities. And um, there, it was 11th street and a, a portion of North main street. And uh, there were a couple of council members who own within 500 feet of that, but we, we drew a geographic boundary 500 feet around it, calculate the number of uh, parcels that were in there and determined that, um, you know, over 15% are, it might have been, and we, we did 25 we, at that 25% at that point and determined that uh, there was more than 25% of the city affected. So it, the, the, those council members were able to participate in that decision. Cause I think otherwise we were in a position where we were going to have to be drawing lots uh, to, to, to make sure that we had quorum. So 
it does happen occasionally. Yeah, so if you have questions, feel free to ask as we go through. Um, so for recusal, um, if you do have a conflict, that means you can't vote on the matter. And, and really the recusal procedure is visible to the public when you're on the dais, but it actually applies throughout the life of the governmental decision. So you're really not even supposed to be, um, with one exception, you're not supposed to be lobbying others in favor or against the decision on which you have a conflict even outside of the meeting. But for purposes of the meeting, what the council member or planning commissioner, whoever is making the decision needs to do is they need to publicly identify the financial interest at the beginning of the item in sufficient detail to, so that the, um, that the public understands why you're recusing yourself. And there is an exception to that, of course, which is if it's a closed session item uh, and, and by disclosing the, the reason why you have the financial interest, you are somehow um, conveying confidential information that you don't have to do that. And then you need to <clears throat> recuse yourself from discussing and voting. You need to actually leave the room after uh, leave the room after you've disclosed what your conflict is um, and then not come back until the item is complete. Uh, the exception to that is if it's on the consent agenda. Uh, and if it's on the consent agenda, you just ask the clerk, you, you announce that you have the conflict and you ask the clerk to ensure that the minutes reflect that you are not voting on, you know, consent item B or whatever. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask. So in years gone by, um, on the consent agenda, we have approval of the KXBX library park thing. It's on consent. And at the end of the year, you know, we, we used to get hired to do the the barbecue for all the sponsors. But if it were a similar situation where we approve an event and there's reasonable expectation that we've been hired there before and it's on consent, then that would be a situation where I go, you know, we've always been hired there. There's, it's reasonable to accept that we will be back. Then I would say that I, I wanna be recused from that consent item because there's a potential for some more than uh, well, what, whatever the term was, uh, measurable amount material of benefit, material yeah. benefit yeah or reasonably in yeah. this case it's a reasonable is yeah. it reasonably foreseeable and so yeah if it's reasonably foreseeable yeah then you would just say hey i have to bow out of that. i think one time there was something like that and you asked me um you said i don't think you should vote on that because previously and there's a reasonable expectation it could happen again yeah that's right and this is a good point to make these rules apply to you as council members individually, okay? They obviously, they can affect the city's ability to um, have decisions validly entered into, but the repercussions can also be individual to you. The Fair Political Practices Commission can fine you as an individual for violating the Political Reform Act. So it behooves you to disclose something like that and ensure that it's been included in the minutes because that is going to be your protection from if the FPPC ever asks about it. And so, yes, so for the consent agenda, you just have to disclose it before the meeting, before the item is voted on, make sure that it's in the meeting. So that you would say that rather than pull it at that moment, is anybody right? You don't have to pull it. it. You don't I, have to pull I would it. say, Madam Mayor, I, I don't want to pull one, but I want to recuse myself from item B, whatever. Right, because, because I have a reasonable a, I, expectation that this of is going to be a source of income bank. to me um, of five hundred dollars or more. Yeah. There's also one other nuance, which is um, if you have a personal, like say, say, um, you know, say your home is near a potential development, um, and you can't vote on an item because of that. The Political Reform Act does understand, and the legislature did understand, that council members don't give up their First Amendment rights when they become council members. So it does allow, even though you're supposed to leave the room, if you are the only one who can convey a, 
uh, personal interest to the council, then you are there is limited ability to come and speak from the podium, not from the dais, as to your personal interest in a particular item. So that that sounds like, um, I mean, you were very clear, but it's a little bit of a quandary because if it's my personal interest, then who besides me could be the only one to convey my personal interest? Right. So if it's your, if you're the only one who can, then you're allowed to leave the dais and sit in the chambers and then speak at the podium at public comment, just like the public. Who, who else could? If it's well, for example, life. if you own property and you're married, your spouse probably has an equal um, interest in that property. The spouse could do it. If it's related to a business entity and it's a partnership and there are other partners, you know, consider having those individuals come and make those statements gotcha. instead of Thank you. Instead of you. Um, contracts. Those of you who have been on the council for a while know that if you see a contract on the agenda, you need to be careful because there is a special rule about contracting. If you are on both sides of the con, if you are on one side as a council member and the other side as a party or an indirect participant in the contract, then that may prohibit the city from entering into that contract completely even if it's a great contract, even if it's a great deal. Uh, and this is in codified in government code section 1090. So in this case, if you see a contract, I mean, it does apply to direct and indirect interest. So it, the law will kind of follow the breadcrumbs, even if you're, you know, even if the city is not contracting with, you know, the market, your market, if they can follow the breadcrumbs and somewhere down the line, you as a council member have an interest in that contract, you know, we should we should flag that and we should talk about it. There are there are exceptions, but they're they're only they're statutory. And you have to look at the remote interest in section 1091, which allow you, much like the Political Reform Act, they allow you to disclose the interest and recuse yourself, in which case the city can enter into the contract. And then there are also remote interests in 1091.5, which the legislature has basically said. This is not something to worry about. You can enter into the contract. You can vote on it. Sometimes there's a disclosure requirement, but you can still vote on it. Um, but it is important when that that we scrutinize contracts that come before the city because there are real uh, consequences, not just necessarily a fine. There are their willful violations is um, can get you in jail. Um, the contract benefits we have to, we, the city have to give all of them back. Uh, anything that we got, because the contract is void and unenforceable as if it never should have happened. So something that we need to all watch out for. All right, I'm not gonna go into common law uh, conflict of interest, which was kind of the third area of conflicts, which you probably learned about in your AB 1234 training, because I wanna talk about AB 1439. AB 1439 is an amendment that was went into effect January 1st, and it amends the Levine Act. The Levine Act is part of the Political Reform Act. The Levine Act has been around for a long time, but it only applied to state and local appointed officials. So actually it applied to, so it applies to plan, it applied to planning commissioners. It applied to LAFCO commissioners because they're appointed, right? And what that law said was that uh, unlike the Political Reform Act, it said if you receive a campaign contribution of more than $250 from a person who's appearing before LAFCO, for example, and you receive a campaign contribution from that person, then you need to disclose that and recuse yourself. You can't, you can't vote on that. So in the past, the Political Reform Act has always said campaign contributions is not income. It's not a gift it doesn't count when it comes to financial interests because it's part of the political process. It's how democracy works. Um, and so we, we didn't really have to worry about that unless you were one of these situations where you were on an appointed um, board. And often those people aren't running for any, any office so they don't have to worry about it anyway. That has all changed. 
um, with AB 1439. So what AB 1439 did is it extended the Levine Act to elect local elected officials, which it never applied to before. And in the past, it was really just a three month look back. Now it's 12 months. So it's, it's pretty complicated and it's new. Uh, the FPPC is currently developing regulations to help us through this. It already um, passed an official opinion that campaign contributions from last November won't apply because normally you'd think, okay, it's January 1 and it has a 12 month look back for campaign contributions that would go back to the last election. But the FPPC came out and said, because Cal cities and everybody was like, hold on, you know, this sounds like retroactive application of law. They came around and said, okay, don't have to worry about the November campaign contributions, but starting January 1, any campaign contribution you have is going to be dealt with under the um, AB 1439 Levine Act. All right, so I'm going to try to break this down. It's complicated. Feel free to ask questions. There's probably things that I'll get to by the end of these slides that I won't get to yet. So bear with me for the time being. AB 1439 kind of looks at this in three different chunks. Okay, it looks at the time before you make a decision as a council member for, on a particular item. And it says that you, uh, if you received more than $250 within the preceding 12 months from a party, a participant, or their agent, and now that person comes before you for a license permit or other entitlement for use, then you have a conflict. You'd have to disclose it and recuse yourself. This is for things that happened in the last 12 months. The next is if there's a pending proceeding. So if there is actually, um, if, if a party has filed an application for a license, a permit, or other entitlement for use that's pending before the city, and you accept or solicit, just ask for campaign contributions or direct campaign contribution of more than $250, um, then you've violated this law and there's some provisions for giving it back or you're going to have to disclose and recuse once that license comes up. And then there's the post decision phase. So you went through this whole process, you, you uh, approved this contract with this party and then 12 months later they contribute, they try to contribute to your campaign um, with $251. That's a violation. Uh, you can't accept, solicit, or direct contribution of more than $250 from a party, a participant, or their agent involved in the decision for 12 months after the decision. Okay. If you do end up receiving this contribution, right, of over $250, you have to disclose that fact and recuse yourself from making the decision. That's for one. That's for when you receive this the contribution in the twelve months before the decision. Right? That's in the pre-decision phase. This is the result. You have to recuse. If you received it while it was pending, while the application was pending before the city, then you can return it within thirty days of the date that you know or should have known that this person who contributed had a, had a pending application. You might not even know. You know, these are things that are being dealt with by staff in the initial, the initial uh, goings on. And then the third one is the post decisional phase. So you made a decision, you awarded the contract, and then um, you get a camp campaign co contribution from that person of more than $250. You have to return it. You only have 14 days to return it. Uh, and you can't have knowingly solicited it from the person knowing that they had a, that they were a party to that decision. So, and it's very broad, this law. It doesn't just apply to the person who 
files the application for a license permit or entitlement for use. Um, that is the party. It applies to the party. It applies to their agents. So like a lot of times developers will, the property owner will hire uh, a firm to kind of get the application processed. So those will be the agents. Can't accept the contributions from them either. But the crazy thing is that it applies to what's called a participant. And a participant is a person who supports or opposes a particular decision and who has a financial interest in the proceeding. So for example, say you're making a decision um, to rezone some property for a developer. And uh, you have been very careful not to accept more than $250 from the developer or from the developer's agent. But um, as you're sitting on the dais listening to public comment, um, one of your contributors comes up um, and says, I live within 500 feet of this development. You didn't know that. That person has just indicated they have a financial interest. Um, Going to jail. And I oppose this, and I oppose this. You now have a participant in a proceeding who has donated more than $250 to you. And you are going to either have to disclose that and recuse, disclose that fact and recuse yourself from the decision, or you're gonna have to ensure that you are returning the money to that individual within 30 days, because this is the first time that you've known about this I, happening. I just have images of people throwing money from the dice, like, <laughs> oh, geez, <laughs> right in checks. But yeah. Hang on a sec. <laughs> but I think the takeaway is that 249 is the magic number. <laughs> <laughs> the other crazy thing is what a proceeding is. It's still a little bit unclear. I mean, a lot, it's not a ministerial permit, obviously, because you guys will never see ministerial permits, you know, a business license that issued, that's issued by the finance department. Um, it is land use, any land use entitlement um, licenses, but it also includes contracts other than competitively bid contracts or contracts for personal services. So it's possible it includes most of the PSA, you know, the professional services agreements that you guys approve. Um, franchises, obviously. So it's it's um, it's actually potentially pretty pretty broad um, and something to be cognizant of. So at this point, we the kind of things that we're thinking of that we want to do um, will be to include in our development applications the disclosure requirement because actually. The parties are supposed to be disclosing this as well to us. Uh, we're going to note, we want to note the obligation in, the con in our contracts for disclosure. Um, we may even think about putting it on agendas um, so that people know when they come. And for council members, it's probably worth keeping a list of contributors who provide more than $250 to your campaigns, because that's going to be your way to ensure that the person who shows up to talk isn't a participant that will require you to recuse yourself. I have a quick question. Um, the it, it sounds like this applies to campaign contributions, not a business transaction? Correct. Okay. Because owning a, a business in Lakeport where most of our rentals are more than $250, I wouldn't need to recuse myself anytime somebody wants to rent a boat, wants to rent a boat <laughs> right? Because it's not a campaign contribution. Right, They're right. buying this something only, from this my This only business. applies to campaign contributions. Okay. Um, the source of income prohibition is, the, is a $500 in the last 12 months. Okay. And um, there are exceptions for like supermarkets mm -hmm. because those are open to the general public. Every, you know, anybody can go to them. They're not specialized. Um, 
which may apply to you know your your business as well but we we'd want to think about that because okay. if it's a special you know like stores that sell to you know medical professionals is specialized and so it's it wouldn't fall under that exception so we'd have to think about it okay so but otherwise yes it's five hundred dollars is the source of income this upcoming rental season if i get a local person that rents a boat for more than five hundred dollars i should make a note of that person yeah okay and that that person may need to be just that that source of income may be need to be disclosed on your form 700 okay um it seems like we're done with the formal. Um, it just seems to me. Yes, this concludes my presentation. That when you look at the state of affairs and you listen to the, you know, the, these voluminous amounts of money that these, that these candidates get, and then you see that they're supposed to make one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year, and then they've been in office for five years, and they're a multi-multi-millionaire with three homes worth millions of dollars each. It, it I, is anybody watching the big dogs or are they just coming after us local city council members because it seems like these things are just being run over roughshod and and i and do they have better lawyers or they just tie it up and they wait till 30 years after they get out of office and they're a billionaire and they get to do whatever they want but it seems like so many people in office like insider trading i mean they they even talked about follow pelosi's plan and you know become a multi multi-millionaire and she's in you know influential on certain things the next thing you know she makes a couple you know million dollars over the weekend it just seems like you know, here we are and here trying to do the right thing and we got to worry about $500 boat rental and whether or not I, I sponsor the, you know, a, a barbecue and, and these people, it seems like they go into office, it costs hundreds of thousands or millions to get into office and they get a hundred grand a year. And then next thing you know, you look at their financials and they're in Forbes magazine, you know, one of the richest people in, you know, uh, Texas. I, I don't, I don't get it. Is it. Do they actually go? I know they go after people here. I got contacted by the FPPC because I had one thing I left out on one page. So I know they go after the small people, but do they go after presidents, congressmen, and senators? Well, this the Levine Act does apply to state officials. I imagine it applies, but do they go after them is the question because it seems like they're just running a mile. Well, you also have to look at what, I mean, it, it applies to these permits, licenses, entitlements for use. So legislators the legislature, they're not granting those types of things. They're writing laws, which is different. Um, so the, a lot of these rules wouldn't apply to them by the nature of the decisions that they're making. The other thing it's worth noting is that there is now, there are campaign contribution limits that apply to local officials by default. Um, they're the same rules that apply to those who are running for you know, the state assembly. Um, and they're pretty high. They're like in the over $2,000 or something, and they're adjusted for inflation every few years. So um, obviously there was a concern in the legislature regarding campaign contributions and how they could affect local decisions regarding things these sort of quasi judicial type decisions in terms of permits and licensing and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm not aware of anything that the FBC, FBPC has done with respect to state officials. Nor has anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? 